Um, I'm going to talk today about nutrition and diets uh, for captive amphibians. So I hope this is useful. Uh, there'll be some questions at the end and I will try not to be too long going through it. Um, so before I really go into this, I want to raise the very important caveat that very little on the whole is known about amphibian nutrition. Um, the vast majority of what is known is in terms of sort of empirical stuff about nutritional requirements is derived um, from a handful of laboratory species, things like um, Xenopus lavis, um, Amistoma mexicanum, um, and that's a tiny, tiny proportion of um, amphibian diversity. Um, and we know that there's a huge amount of variation between species in, in, in what they eat and what their requirements are. So all we can do is to think about some general principles um, that are involved and try to cover all the bases and learn from successes and failures and improve as we go along. Um, that said, I'm going to go through what I think are the most important fundamental kind of bits and pieces to think about when planning a diet for captive amphibians. But as with my talk on water quality, this will not be a step-by-step -step how to feed any amphibian uh, sort of instruction manual, but rather things to consider when you're working it out yourself. Because I can't possibly tell you how to feed all 8,000 species of amphibian. So when we're thinking about adult or metamorphosed amphibians, almost all um, amphibians are entirely carnivorous or insectivorous. Um, there's a couple of exceptions. So this Xenohyla truncata, um, which is sometimes called a fruit-eating frog. And I'm getting some strange feedback. Um, seasonally, it will eat um, cactus fruits in very dry sand dunes as a source of moisture. Um, but it is very much the exception rather than the rule. Um, and um, yeah, the vast majority of animals need to eat other animals in order to survive. Amphibian larvae are a very, very different question. Um, they have extremely diverse diets, um, everything from, from obligate herbivory through to omnivory or carnivory. There are filter feeders and all kinds of different weird and wonderful things. And for that reason, I'm going to talk about larvae in a different talk next week. And this thing will focus on post-metamorphic amphibians. The vast majority of amphibians are relatively generalist um, in that they feed on a, whole, a wide variety of taxa and it's usually defined by pretty much anything that's the right size to fit inside them and which isn't toxic, distasteful or otherwise unpleasant to eat. Um, there are some amphibians which are more apparently more specialist, so for example ant feeders, but um, like this hemesis uh, frog you can see on the bottom left of the screen, but pretty much these are just specialist in terms of their gape size rather than what they actually have to eat. So they're not um, specialists in the sense that you might find in some other, uh, other taxa where they really will only survive eating one particular prey item. Um, and even relatively specialist amphibians will still eat a wide variety of species. And this is set against um, what we can offer amphibians in captivity. Because amphibians eat quite a lot um, in, in some cases, and um, because they're quite picky in exactly what they will take, um, we have only a small number of species that are available in large enough and consistent enough numbers in captivity to sustain amphibian populations. And I'm talking here from the perspective of someone um, working in a country, in a region where commercially bred insects are available. Um, but even if we're talking about um, own cultured stuff within an amphibian conservation facility or laboratory, um, it is only possible to grow a certain number of, of, um, of invertebrates before you're um, sort of using all your resources to make invertebrates rather than to raise frogs or other amphibians. So there's this huge difference between what we can, the, the dietary breadth available in captivity and the dietary breadth available to these species in the wild. And just an example of this is um, uh, the mountain chicken frog. It's a frog which I work with at ZSL, uh, critically endangered in the wild and the subject of a long-term uh, conservation program involving captive husbandry and ex-situ conservation. Um, in the wild, um, before this species 
became functionally extinct. Um, some studies showed that it will cons consume more than 150 species of invertebrate um, and sometimes vertebrates. Um, and um, whereas in captivity, this is limited to just a handful. And this is not just about variety and texture and taste for the frogs. This is about nutritional content as well. Um, so some work that I was involved with looked at the nutritional content of the invertebrate that the species were feeding in the wild and compared that to the nutritional content of the captive diet. And in a reasonably uh, sort of comprehensive nutritional uh, review, and we basically showed that um, the captive diet, not only it, does it consist of fewer taxa of insects, but there are some important differences and, and sort of blind spots um, where it isn't meeting what the wild diet contains. We don't know what the implications for the health of the animals is uh, yet, but this is a really good example of where it is basically impossible for us to completely replicate the wild diet of most amphibians. And this means that some degree of planning is involved because we can't just chuck in what they would eat in the wild and let them get on with it. We need to try to replicate the wild as closely as we possibly can, um, despite the limited range of prey available. So if we can find, if we can find that an animal species tends to eat more orthopterans than um, polyopterans, we can try and offer more grasshoppers and crickets than we do beetle larvae. Um, it's important to research your species really thoroughly, as much information as you can possibly get on both it, how it's done, how it lives in the wild, and attempts to keep it in captivity, um, and use that information to identify the most important dietary components um, so that you have some sort of foundation to build your captive diet around. Um, and to try to make that captive diet as similar as possible. Um, if you do have some specialists that seem to importantly require some food items, you might want to look at how to breed those feeders. And the really critical thing, especially for setting up a, a conservation facility, is to make sure that you have all of your diets and you have reliable sources of those diets available and established before, before creating a population. Um, so uh, going back to the mountain chicken frog um, as a good example on Dominica, um, the captive facility for mountain chickens on Dominica developed a farm for invertebrates in order to feed the frogs in captivity. And a similar thing has been now done on Montserrat where local species that were unknown to form part of the frog's diet have been identified. Um, and from those, the ones which are most suitable for culturing in captivity have been established. And this means you don't end up, and that was prior to frogs arriving from um, captive breeding centers in Europe back to Montserrat. And the importance of doing this is you know that you're going to be able to keep your animals well fed and uh, properly nutritioned before you end up with animals that are ill. If you don't know what a frog is, is um, what an amphibian species is gonna eat um, when you're collecting it, there are some morphological cues, uh, clues that you can use to inform that. Um, it's mainly around the sort of the shape of the head. So things that eat micro feeders tend to have these very micro uh, insects tend to have these very small pinched mouths despite the size of the body uh, here's a purple frog generalists are your typical kind of frog shaped um thing um so a sort of a head proportion to the rest of the body and macro feeders that tend to specialize on other vertebrates and very large invertebrates tend to have these giant heads with very very wide gape size like this ceratophorus cornita here other groups of amphibians, Sicilians and uh, salamanders, tend to have slightly less uh, diversity in terms of morphological adaptation to eating particular prey items. Tongue morphology can also be useful to look at. So, uh, and within, for example, dart frogs, ant feeders tend to have very different tongue morphology uh, to those that are more generalist in their approach, which tend to have wider fleshier tongues, things like phyllobates. So we've now looked at our animal, we've planned roughly what we want to go into and we need to make sure that um, uh, we are offering a diet which is as complete nutritionally as possible. So vertebrate food, food, food items are available to feed to amphibians, um, mainly mammals, birds and fish. Very occasionally amphibians and reptiles can be available, but commercially speaking, we're normally talking about mammals, birds and fish. 
So mammals and birds are not usually a natural prey item for amphibians. A few species will eat mammals or birds occasionally, but we should on the whole try to avoid these as part of a diet because they're extremely high in fat and protein compared with invertebrate prey on the whole. Um, and they contain lots of things like fur and feathers, which amphibian digestive systems can struggle to deal with. And not only can this cause long-term issues, you can end up with intestinal impaction from things like um, fur, feathers, beaks, um, and bones. Um, a handful of species will eat more mammals and birds, but um, on the whole, that's not really a good part of a captive diet. Um, fish, there are lots of um, um, amphibians that feed on fish. Um, Kiv cryptobranchids, for example, um, some Asian newts, Paramecia triton, Pachytriton. Um, carrion feeders, things like Sicilians, aquatic Sicilians will often eat fish. Um, and fish, in terms of its nutritional content, is more similar to amphibians um, than other sort of commercially available things are. So for animals that eat a lot of other amphibians in the wild, um, fish can become quite a good surrogate. It is important, however, to be really careful of the origin um, of the fish to make sure that they are, um, um, to think about the marine origin of the, of the animals. So uh, a, a saltwater fish will have typically a higher salt content and long term that can cause issues for animals eating them, freshwater animals eating them. Um, and lots of fish are high in thiaminases, which deep down, which are... Uh, um, uh, vitamin B, uh, especially carp family, um, uh, carp family fish, um, and it should be really, really careful to avoid overdosing on that. Um, there are some ethical issues if using vertebrates, especially if feeding them live. Um, that's generally not necessarily for, necessary for amphibians that will take when movement is simulated with forceps or uh, for. Um, yes, I think, uh, yeah, I was just muted and was going to go back. Um, the, um, there are some ethical issues around feeding live things. That's generally something we can avoid. Um, and it's really important to make sure that uh, any vertebrates are treated accordingly to avoid uh, parasites and other diseases. So typically fresh froze, flash frozen and irradiated um, uh, vertebrates are ideal. Um, if they're fresh, they should be screened for parasites. Um, and other potentials for disease vectoring. Otherwise, you can introduce those to your own systems. Everything from fish lice to, to, uh, to BD. So invertebrates are gonna make up the, the majority of prey items for captive um, amphibians generally. Um, there's a list here of some sort of typical uh, food items that are usually available commercially. Um, both for aquatic and terrestrial animals. Um, but one can also very readily culture additional ones that are often not available in bulk commercially, things like wood lice, uh, small um, anelid worms, snails, uh, and cockroaches. And then there's a whole bunch of other diets, of artificial diets that are available. Pellets, flakes, and dried food um, are often formulated to be nutritionally complete, which is great if you can get animals to eat them. But because they're not alive, um, they rot quickly in the environment um, and they're typically only available only really useful for aquatic animals that hunt by smell um, and even then some animals may not take it without individual hand feeding of them which is not uh, really viable in a large collection um, they can be high in some con compounds um, so iodine is there because for uh, pedomorphic um, amphibians this can trigger uh, metamorphosis uh, which you obviously don't want um, and some things like freeze-dried invertebrates, gammarous or, uh, or bloodworms, are, are usually very poor nutritionally, um, and they may not even be accepted by animals. Frozen foods are really great, especially for aquatic animals. Uh, you get a very wide variety of invertebrates um, and sort of mixes, mixes, which are all available as sort of frozen blocks, and you just defrost when you need them, which makes them convenient. They do rot quickly, so you've got to be careful of their impact on aquatic systems and on um, bacterial and, and, and nitrogenous waste load even in terrestrial systems 
uh, they don't move. Um, so for terrestrial animals, you may need to train animals to eat them uh, or use hand feeding. Um, you've got to store them properly, um, which means maintaining the f uh, their frozen status so they don't uh, thaw and, and, uh, and refreeze. Um, and as I said, you've got to thaw these before feeding out. So rather than dumping a load of frozen um, cubes in the tank, it's better to defrost them to the side, drain off the sort of juice that comes with them because it was pollute your aquarium, and then add them into the water. We can obviously rely on what animals eat in nature, and this is a good way to get the, the best variety of nutritional completeness. Um, you can collect meadow sweepings um, for terrestrial, uh, to collect terrestrial invertebrates are going out into grassland or similar with um, uh, sweeping nets and, uh, and collecting small invertebrates that way. And the similar can be done in aquatic systems for um, small aquatic invertebrates. And one can even potentially collect haplos and other amphibians for high specialist animals where that's required um, or other vertebrates indeed. Um, the advantage of this is that you get of real diversity of invertebrate of, of, of food items, um, which are usually of very high nutritional value themselves. It's generally free to do as long as you can go out and get the transport, and you can collect um, a good variety of tiny, um, a variety of sizes for amphibians, which can be useful for very small animals uh, where it's hard to get cultured food um, for the right size. The problems, of course, include. Um, uh, the possible introduction of predatory species. It would be very, very easy to introduce, for example, fish lice, as you can see on this salamander at the bottom, um, um, or to introduce parasites or diseases, or for that matter, um, chemical contaminants, uh, such as pesticides, especially given the, the proclivity of, of modern humans for spraying toxic things onto grasslands, etc. Um, and also collecting these things takes time um, and it can be unreliable. If you're relying entirely on this kind of uh, collection from nature and you have a bad collection week or it's very dry or something like that, uh, you may end up with not enough food to feed your animals. So at the very best, this sort of uh, collecting feeders from nature should be a very well risk assessed um, addition to uh, a fundamental supply of cultured insects. So as well as the fact that we have only uh, a handful of invertebrates which are commonly cultured for feeding captive amphibians, they are typically quite nutritionally poor in themselves. They're high in protein and phosphates and many of them are very high in fat and they are deficient in a whole bunch of different things, especially calcium and other minerals and some vitamins. Um, that's not the case for crustaceans and stars which are generally quite good for calcium. Um, and some are not only relatively high in fat, some of them are exceptionally high in fat. So wax worms, for example, are um, sort of junk food for amphibians um, and can be really quite unhealthy in their fat level. I'm not going to go into this in huge detail, but I have put at the bottom of the slide some references to some really good uh, published work on the nutritional content of a whole variety of different feeder insects. I'm not going to go into it because there are table after table of different values um, and it's just not really worth putting into a presentation. But the data are there and it is possible to identify gaps in nutrition and then work out ways to get around them. The gaps in nutrition can cause a whole bunch of different um, nutritional deficiency diseases in amphibians. And this is probably the most common class of disease that presents clinically um, in captive amphibians, um, i.e. not pathogenic disease, but just um, disease related, resulting from inappropriate diets. Hypovitaminosis A, so a deficiency of vitamin A, um, affects um, uh, integument and mucosa, and you often get what is called short tongue syndrome in an animals that shoot their tongues. The um, lack of vitamin A means that the uh, squamous cells in the, the tongue and other mucosa are less elastic, essentially, and so the tongue can't shoot, and the animal then quickly starves to death. Uh, a variety of different problems with the skin, including ulcers, and poor healing. Um, the animal generally grows slowly because it has less vitamin A to feel that um, where vitamin A is needed. And you can get generalized symptoms like edema or bloat. Uh, hypervitaminosis B, um, which is a thiamine uh, deficiency. Um, and I mentioned this earlier with uh, fish, uh, frozen fish, which can have high levels of thiaminase and degrade thiamine. 
typically leads to neurological disorders over long periods of time, um, which is again quite generic, but it's one potential cause of those. Carotenoids are not known to have direct health benefits, um, but many of the amphibians we work with have flash or other or camouflage coloration dependent on carotenoids. You can see these photos from some work done at Manchester University by Vicky o Ogilvy showing the difference between sibling red-eyed tree frogs fed on high and low carotenoid diets. Um, and her work has shown that although this may not that this that this may not affect direct health, it may affect the ability of animals to breed in captivity and to attract mates in the wild. Now, Richard Preziosi covered this in much more detail in his uh, lecture of a couple of weeks ago. Probably the most frequently encountered um, nutritional deficiency seen in captive amphibians is calcium um, and vitamin D3. So these two elements of the diet um, revolve, um, are essential for healthy calcium metabolism, um, which is critical for the health of not only the skeletal structure, um, but also of neurological function. And vitamin D3 is basically uh, a component of that in that it allows calcium to be actively uptaken from the diet. Vitamin D3 can be part of the diet and it also can be part of the UVB um, provision, uh, which Ben Tapley talked about last week or the week before, uh, but it, can, it is part of the diet. If calcium is not available in sufficient amounts, um, it can lead to nutritional metabolic bone disease or nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism, whereby in order to maintain sufficient levels of calcium in the bloodstream and nerves, um, calcium is either let, not laid down in the bones in juvenile animals or is drawn out of the bones to keep uh, nerves and other functions um, functioning. Um, basically, this ends in, in, in rickets, um, first of all. So animals develop uh, rubbery, deformed skeletons that fracture easily. Um, you typically find them sitting in more flattened postures because they can't physically hold themselves up because their skeleton is collapsing. Um, and if this gets bad enough, you'll then get neurological symptoms, um, especially on excitation. So a frog may look, look okay until it jumps to collect, uh, to grab a prey item or goes through a period of stress and handling where it will then ex exhaust its blood calcium levels and, um, and, um, and begin to, to have neurological symptoms. And eventually this will result in death. Um, it can also occur when phosphate outbalances calcium in the diet um, because the blood again has to has to uh, balance phosphate and calcium in the blood and will take calcium out of the bones in order to outweigh phosphate in the blood um, this sort of, um, of thing is generally correctable in terms of keeping them alive by improving the calcium content of the diet but typically skeletal deformities caused by calcium deficiency will stabilize and they should so they should not get better and fracture should heal but they will not correct so once the animal skeleton is misshapen meaningfully it will stay that way fat is very um high in captive in the invertebrates uh, that are fed to captive amphibians, and it's quite high in a lot of the, it is very high in lots of the vertebrate for prey items that are often fed as well. This can obviously lead to um, just plain old obesity in animals, which has its own implications, especially for animals that are intended for translocation to the wild. Uh, but it can also start to be laid down in tissues um, where it shouldn't be. So, as well as in actual fat tissues, a, a, a typical one that can be laid down is in the eye. You can uh, have animals develop corneal lipidosis where excess fat is deposited in the cornea. Um, this is irreversible. It can be stopped. Um, so an animal can remain, retain some vision, but you will never um, remove those bits of fat that have already been laid down. Um, it's possible to overdose um, on a lot of different uh, vitamins and minerals. Um, Vitamins A and D are particularly common for this, uh, especially where uh, keepers diligently try to supplement them in the diet and go too far. And these can lead to a whole variety of different signs, um, which is not uh, so generalized, it's not really worth discussing here, um, but it is something to be think, to think about. So how do we improve the nutritional content of uh, feeder insects that are basically missing key nutritional groups? for our captive animals. 
basically, if we, if we think about the cricket as an empty capsule in many ways, we can fill that capsule, which means that we can um, gut load animals. This means creating a diet for the insects um, to feed on, which contains the things which they're deficient in. Um, there are, there's no one perfect diet out there because it depends on the requirements of your amphibians and on the invertebrates that are, you're being fed on it. Uh, but a combination of a whole bunch of different fresh fruits, vegetables, um, uh, and chemical products can be beneficial. And there is quite a lot of literature on this um, out there. Um, it doesn't work terribly well for calcium because the majority of arthropods die if they're fed on enough calcium to meaningfully improve their calcium content. And we'll come to how to look at calcium later. Um, gut loading should take at least 48 hours. Um, the evidence suggests that at least for nutritional groups that have been looked at, 48 hours is when, cal when, when at least uh, when crickets tend to max out on their nutritional improvement. Um, and also some insects gut load better than others. Uh, Richard Preziosi co covered this briefly in his talk. Um, uh, but for carotenoids, black crickets, for example, are better than brown crickets because they consume larger quantities of, of food. So for uh, those things which we can't easily supplement by uh, gut loading, uh, so calcium being the chief amongst them, we can do by supplementary dusting. So in this way, you get your feeder insects, you cover them in a fine powder made pr primarily from calcium carbonate, uh, but containing a whole variety of trace vitamins and minerals. These are av available commercially. Um, they're dusted onto the insect, so when the, when the, the animal grabs um, and eats that food item, they ingest all of the minerals that are covering it. And this allows us to achieve um, amounts of calcium, for example, in feeder insects that would be impossible by gut loading because the insect would die before it reaches that level. However, because it is on the outside of the animal, um, it is lost faster um, than um, gut loading is. Um, and so it's important to ensure that animals eat quickly. So for a nocturnal animal, this means feeding um, the animals when they are active, for example. And it's important to store uh, this sort of supplement dry. An important point uh, regarding both types of supplementation, that is gut loading and supplementary dusting, um, is that the nutritional content of invertebrates will decline the longer they are in the enclosure. Um, either because they'll shed the powder or because they'll void their guts. And that means that it's important to feed insects in at a time and in a quantity where they'll be consumed quickly, uh, rather than putting lots and lots of invertebrates in and allowing the animal to eat them when it wants. So we've prepared our diet, we know what we're going to feed it, we know how we're going to supplement it. How do we make sure that the animal, first of all, eats our food and that it has the nutritional content that we intended when the animal does eat it. The general rule, as I've said, is that food should be consumed as quickly as possible, which maximizes nutrition and minimizes the risk of pollution of the environment through dying invertebrates and also predational stress, because a lot of invertebrates such as crickets will start to chew on amphibians if they become hungry and predator can become the prey. Think about when the animal is active. So um, if an animal is nocturnal when it feeds, you should be adding food to the enclosure during the nocturnal cycle or as close to it as possible. So those animals, have, those insects are still accessible and nutritionally sound when they're eaten. Um, and one can also manipulate the activity patterns of the amphibians themselves by mimicking the conditions that stimulate feeding activity in the wild. So a lot of amphibians, for example, in drier places will only come out to feed um, when there's been precipitation or when the temperatures are right. So by spraying the enclosures, for example, we can, uh, before feeding, we can get the animals to come out looking for food, which again means they're going to take very nutritionally uh, rich animals. We should also think about how the animals forage so how, where in the environment do they find their food? If they're aquatic, do they find their food on the, on the substrate? Do they find it in the middle of the water column or the surface? Um, are they feeding on the floor or are they feeding in the branches? And choosing um, feeder, in, uh, feeder insects, etc., that actually fit that niche. 
So for a, a canopy dwelling tree frog, which might be reluctant to come to the floor to feed, it may do better on flying insects or invertebrates that will climb into the branches. We need to make sure that um, food is the right size for the animals. Amphibians don't chew, they swallow prey whole. Um, and so it's important that we don't offer prey items that are too large. And it's also important that we don't offer food items that are so small that they escape the notice of the animal or simply so many need to be eaten that it doesn't actually get enough food. The general rule of thumb is to think about the distance between the eyes of the animal and the longest that the, for a, an insect, uh, or something like that, the, the length of the cricket should not be too much longer than the distance between the eyes of the animal. Earthworms can be longer, but should be no wider than the, le than the uh, distance between the eyes. Um, but make sure that you allow for things with specialist mouth parts. So for example, ant feeding animals with very, uh, like the hemesis or the uh, purple frog uh, that we saw in this presentation, the rule between the eyes thing doesn't apply to that. And we need to make sure that they can actually fit the food item into their tiny mouths. Movement is usually really important, especially for terrestrial animals. And that's why I've got the T-Rex there in case you were wondering. Um, so we need to make sure we are choosing prey items and food types that stimulate that uh, predatory drive. This is why pelleted foods, for example, will not work for the vast majority of terrestrial amphibians because they simply don't recognize it as food unless it moves. Um, aquatic animals may food find, will often find some of their food by scent, but movement can also be important. Um, and choosing feeder species that have a movement appropriate for the, the predation detection um, sort of neurology of the species in question are important. So for example, some animals are much more attuned to the movement of earthworms, while as others are more attuned to the movement of fast moving insects. Worms can be a really, really good source of food, um, but they can be a bit challenging to feed to, um, to animals. So this is just a few practical tricks for getting animals to eat these things. Um, for very small animals, earthworm pieces, earthworms can be chopped with a scalpel into small pieces um, or a razor blade. And the beauty of this is that the small pieces will continue to wriggle. So they will stimulate uh, the animal to eat them while being small enough for them to manage to do it. And they can either be just placed in front of the animal using forceps or literally held in front of it for it to take if necessary. Aquatic worms, everything from Coronomus um, midge larvae, which are called blood worms, through to tubifex, um, can be really great food items, even for terrestrial, item, of terrestrial animals. And it's just a matter of presenting them in the right way. By folding up a um, piece of wet paper towel, especially if it can be bunched or placed over a, a small rubber uh, gasket or similar so that it forms a bowl, can allow you to place aquatic worms um, in damp conditions on land where the animals will come and feed on them and they can also be dusted with succulent that way. If one needs to get animals to eat um, dead food or if one has a group of animals where not all are feeding as well and you want to target food to a particular one, um, it can be useful to tongue feed animals. Um, so Forceps are really important for this, and they should be of a size which allows you to reach to the animal without disturbing it, and they should also be blunt so the animal doesn't stab itself if it tries to take food. Um, this can be great, as I said, for targeting particular individuals to make sure that all animals are getting enough food, or for delivering oral modic medication to some animals. So if you need to make sure that the animal needs a particular prey item immediately, tongue feeding it can be really useful. The other advantage of this method of presentation is to avoid uh, uneaten food rotting in the tank because you can literally make sure that it goes down the animal's throat. A really common question of people who are starting to keep a given amphibian in captivity is how much do I feed it and how often? There's no one answer to this because it will depend on the individual um, and the time of year, etc., and on the species more generally. Some animals will need to be fed daily, others don't need to be fed for a month, a month or more. Um, and it really depends on their ecology um, and also so what they eat and on their meta metabolic activity. So um, dendrobated frogs, for example, um, eat small prey items and are extremely active um, and so typically need to be fed daily. Um, the uh, Olms, Proteus sanguinus in the middle, may uh, not move for a decade, lives in extremely cold conditions and has very, 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 very low met metabolic rate and therefore does not need to be fed very much very often. Uh, Ceratophorus, for example, um, on the right, 
uh, eat very infrequently, but eat very large prey items very often. So they may not need to eat so frequently. Whereas an individual of the same species that has only been fed on small invertebrates for a while may need to be fed more quickly. So the best thing to do is to start with an estimate based on other people's experience with the species in captivity, based on your own experience with other species in captivity, um, and uh, based on understanding of how the species lives in the wild, and then monitor its behavior, its body condition, its growth and its weight, and adjust feeding accordingly so that you're maintaining animals that grow at the right speed but don't become obese. Some amphibians are absolutely minuscule, especially as juveniles, um, and this can be really problematic to find commercial live food for. The little tiny newt, I think it's an eastern newt on the finger in the picture, will be too small to eat the smallest commercial um, prey item out there, which are normally hatchling crickets. The best solutions for these are to collect microfoods for nature if necessary, to um, culture specific foods. So there are some specialist foods that can be cultured in order to uh, cater to very tiny things, especially from the fish keeping hobby where people need to feed, feed fish fry very frequently. Um, or you can create tanks for these animals to live in in which microfoods naturally um, breed and the animal can feed itself. And as soon as it's large enough to take commercial foods, it can be switched over to that sort of diet. So what happens if animals aren't feeding? And inappetence is a really frequently encountered problem with captive amphibians. It's usually the result of something being wrong, unless it's just that the animal isn't hungry. Um, so, so if an animal is refusing to feed, especially if it's starting to lose condition because it's not fed for so long, make sure that its husbandry parameters um, are correct and that, the, that social interactions in any group animals are also favorable. For territorial animals, an animal may be constantly bullied if it loses its territory and this may cause it to, to refuse food. Um, try a variety of foods and sizes. Sometimes changing to a new prey item or a preferred prey item um, may stimulate an animal to feed. Um, change the setup or furniture or size of the enclosure. It could be that the animal is feeling um, like it can't find somewhere where it's happy to settle down and the increased stress levels of that may in, uh, inhibit feeding. Um, adjust the temperature and humidity um, to match the animal's I ideal uh, foraging environment. Um, adjust photo period so that you're feeding um, in, at, at night. Um, adjust the light intensity. A lot of amphibians don't like extremely bright lighting and can be stressed. And by having very bright lighting, they may not feed. Equally, some other species that live in very bright environments, so for, from Europe, the water frogs or pelophylax live in extremely sun-drenched environments. And if they're kept under too dingy conditions, their feeding response may be minimized. Uh, change how your feet are uh, approaching uh, food presentation. So to make sure that the animal is recognizing it as food. Um, and to avoid disturbance while feeding. So very often, uh, even the, the hungriest amphibian will be put off feeding for a good length of time if it's worried it's gonna be predated. So making sure that the food goes in without disturbance and the animal is left to feed um, can be useful. So for that sense, adding a known number of invertebrates and then counting them back out may be more successful than trying to watch an animal eat in front of you. If all of that fails, force feeding may be necessary. For some animals, um, that have gone off food, particularly if they've uh, started to become quite metabolically challenged as a result, force feeding them can stimulate hunger and stimulate gut, gut movement that gets an animal eating again. But the most important ingredient is patience. We've seen a lot of these animals don't eat, or eat free frequently, and by over-intervening, we can start a vicious cycle where the animal refuses to feed, so we intervene more, so it eats less, and eventually we'll lose the animal to starvation or opportunistic infection. So this is just a brief set of, of, um, of stills showing how you might go about force feeding an animal uh, or assist feeding an animal. Uh, the animal's restrained, its mouth is open using a flat object and that needs to be done with extreme care. A prey item is added um, and usually at that point the feeding reflex takes on and the animal will happily swallow what's been eaten. If it won't do that, tube feeding directly into the stomach may be necessary but that should be done um, under the advice and supervision of a veterinary, veterinarian. So overall, the important 
Um, so points of what I've covered, I think, are that a varied diet as much as possible is important. It should be sourced safely, um, both for the individuals in the collection and for the, the environment at large. Once you've got your diet, it needs to be supplemented appropriately to ensure the deficiencies and, and um, over supplementation don't occur. Um, it should be chosen to make sure that it is suitable for both the species in question, but also the individuals. And it needs to be presented in the right way. And if you can bring those ingredients together, you should uh, end up with animals that are nutritionally healthy and, um, and able to, to, to feed and stay that way.